Good morning, everyone. Happy Tuesday. It is hard to believe that we are um, midway through October, almost at the end of 2020, <laughs> which may be good news for, for some of us. Um, but welcome, everyone. Uh, it's good to see, see all of you. We are really excited about this particular coffee chat today, where we are you're actually pretty much our first audience that is going to see this core results menu. And so we're, uh, you're also gonna be our kind of like our guinea pigs as we uh, give a tour of this uh, online menu uh, in DataShare and uh, looking really forward to hearing what your feedback is as well. So I'm gonna share my screen again and just quickly scroll through. I'll give you the short version of this. Um, and let me just start off by, uh, again, saying who I am and, and introduce, introducing my colleagues on the call. I'm Paul Young, and I'm one of the core consultants um, working on facilitating this countywide initiative called the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based, or CORE, Investments. And I'm joined uh, this morning by my co-host. Hi, everyone. Nicole Lezen here. Welcome. And our wonderful interpreter today, Maricela Quesada from Unique Interpreting Services. Thank you so much, Maricela, for being here today. And so we are, we have a lot to cover, but we want to just make sure that everyone is able to um, participate and, and be on the right language channel. And so just really quickly, if you haven't already done these things during the, our soft start, um, we'd like to encourage you to select your language channel either English or Spanish. So you'll need to look for the globe icon if you're on the Zoom app on a you know, desktop or, or a laptop. If you're on a phone, I believe you have to uh, click uh, more to get to the interpretation option. But select a language channel, either English or Spanish. If you select Spanish, uh, also select mute original audio so that you're not hearing uh, both speakers or both languages at the same volume. And then it helps us to know uh, who, is, who is listening on which channel. And so the way for us to know that, or the only way for us to know that is if you rename yourselves. And so we're gonna ask you to open the participant list, either clicking on the icon on your Zoom meeting control bar uh, that looks like people, or if you're on a, a phone, uh, click on the participant. I think there's also a participant icon. Should open up the list of participants, like what you see here. And if you uh, hover your mouse over your name or tap on your name, you should see a, either a more button or an option to rename yourself. And so we're going to ask you to add three letters after your name, either ENG for English, ESP for Espanol, or BIL if you're bilingual and might actually switch back and forth between the two language channels. So if you can do that, that would be great. Let us know if you need help with that. Uh, feel free to send us a chat in the chat box. We'll go ahead and get started now. And hopefully several of you already know by now because we know that some of you are repeat attendees at these core coffee chats, which we love. Um, but for those of you that, that may be new or, or don't know yet, uh, we wanna give a little bit of an overview about CORE. So again, CORE stands for the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based Investments. And it actually started a few years ago as a funding model that the County of Santa Cruz and the City of Santa Cruz adopted as their way of funding safety net services uh, in our county. And then shortly after that, um, the Board of Supervisors uh, said, you know, this isn't just um, this big shift or this big change in how we fund safety net services. Um, this isn't the end of it. We really wanna continuously improve this core model. Um, and so we were, Nicole Lez and I were selected as the consulting team to facilitate this ongoing process of really refining and, and fine tuning the core funding model. But really what we found as we started working with more nonprofits and government agencies, our local government agencies, health and human services, you know, our local funders, what we started finding was that there's so much more potential for core than, than being just a funding model or just a way to issue grants. And so really over the last few years through a lot of discussions and uh, learning opportunities like these core coffee chats. CORE has evolved into 
what we call both a funding model and a movement to achieve equitable health and well-being in Santa Cruz County using a results-based collective impact approach that's responsive to community needs. And again, all of this was developed with quite a variety of input from, again, many different types of people and organizations and, and partners. And we arrived at this mission statement and vision statement that you see on the screen. And, and I won't read them word for word, but hopefully these words really stand out to you about collective action, safe, healthy community, equitable opportunities, resilient, thriving, and notice how equity is at the center uh, and front and center in, in all of those statements. And so when we talk about equitable health and well-being, we mean that all people across the lifespan have equitable opportunities to experience these eight core conditions for health and well-being. And you know, the key being how interconnected they are. So health and wellness, lifelong learning and education, economic security and mobility, thriving families, community connectedness, healthy environments, a safe and just community, and stable, affordable housing and shelter. And so we want to be able to live in a community where a person's opportunities and their outcomes <clears throat> can't be predicted for better or for worse based on things like race or ethnicity or income or gender or sexual orientation. So that's what we mean by equitable health and well-being and being able to use data to help us understand how close we are to that vision of equity or how far away we are from that vision and where there are disparities and gaps. Uh, having access to that kind of data to help inform us becomes really important. And so today's topic of this core results menu on data share um, is gonna introduce you to a tool that we have um, been working on for a couple of years, but just recently had it go live online last Friday afternoon. Uh, but it's a way to, to think about and understand and see what kind of data is available in each of these eight core conditions. Um, and again, notice how equity is at the center of this diagram because we want to use both data and lived experience and uh, research and, and, and our own wisdom to really, again, understand <clears throat> where we can be taking collective action to achieve that vision of equitable health and well-being. And again, this is, uh, this is probably going to be just the first of several coffee chats that we'll offer where we want to uh, help people learn how to use the core results menu that, that lives on DataShare. Um, these coffee chats in general are one way that we try to, uh, you know, build shared knowledge and, and build shared capacity to, um, to, to use re results-based tools and frameworks, again, to achieve our, our common goals and vision for the community. So as we move along today, we encourage you to ask questions in the chat. We may not get to all of them. We probably won't get to all of them, but we hope this will just be an ongoing conversation. And before I turn it over to Nicole Lezen to actually do the tour of, data, of the core results menu on data share, I'm gonna give you a little bit of background about the core results menu. It's come a long, long way since um, we first started talking about this concept of, a, of an online interactive menu that links community level impacts to program outcomes in each of those eight core conditions. And we started off, some of you may recognize these images. This is how we first started conveying this concept of a set of guided um, instructions or questions to kind of lead someone through the thought process of what core condition for health and well-being do you want to impact or do you care about? And really drilling all the way down to what does that look like in terms of results at a program level? What indicators would you measure? What dimensions of equity uh, would you be looking at? So we started with the concept and then started to you know, build some um, excitement and buy-in around the concept of it. So then our next step was to identify community impacts. So coming up with impact statements and indicators for each of the core conditions. And we vetted that, those lists. And again, the, the images we're showing on the screen some of you may recognize they're basically like paper-based <laughs> versions of the menu in its early stages. 
and use that to have a lot of discussions in different community meetings, collaboratives with our core steering committee about the right kinds of impacts that as a community we should be aiming for. Are these the, are these the kinds of things that would tell us what uh, health and well-being looks like at a community level? Is this the kind of data that we would be looking for? So we got a lot of input, several revisions and iterations of that kind of paper-based menu. And then we started getting closer to having to figure out, well, how are we gonna make this go live online? How will we make it interactive? And so we were very fortunate that at that time, our work on this core menu lined up well with the work that was happening to develop DataShare, which is an online data warehouse, data platform that has uh, many, many different types of publicly available um, indicators, data points uh, that are in one central location. And um, just wanna call out the Health Improvement Partnership for the amazing leadership role that they have taken over the last couple of years to, to bring this to life, to bring it, um, the, the, that kind of vision to reality. And so Elisa Arona and Dorian Seamster and Sarah Adler were really instrumental in um, you know, building the partnerships and the buy-in to make this, uh, make this possible. So today won't be an actual training on how to use DataShare, but the core results menu now lives on DataShare. And so they're very much tied together. Once we realized that DataShare would be a good home for the core results menu, then we went through this very in intense, elaborate process of crosswalking or trying to identify, okay, of all these indicators that we have identified in this paper-based version of the core results menu, how many of those already exist in data share? Where are there still data gaps? Uh, what can we do collectively to try to fill those data gaps over time? So we worked really closely with uh, United Way, who is responsible for the community assessment project. We work with um, staff from the county administrative office um, because we wanted to make sure that this all aligned with the county strategic plan. We worked with um, the HIP team, uh, staff from health services agency. It was a very collaborative process, very intense, um, but well worth it because we have a really good picture now of what data is available from the core results menu actually on data share and where are the gaps that we still need to fill. And so all of that work then, again, this was all kind of paper or Excel sheet <laughs> um, based work. And now it has been turned into this live menu on data share. And so at this point, I'm going to stop my screen share and let Nicole Lesson take over to give us the tour. Thanks, Nicole. Hoping everyone can see this on my screen. So this is the DataShare landing page, the home page. And if you have not visited DataShare overall, I really encourage you to do so. It's such a tremendous resource for our county. And of course, we're very excited about the core results menu living here, but it's just a broader uh, resource than the core results menu itself. And so it's great that we can integrate the two, but there's just a lot here for, for all of us. Before I dive in, I also wanted to remind everyone that Although this button lets you see the home page in Spanish, if you really want to see all of the pages in Spanish, you go up to this upper right hand corner where there's a translate to. You could also see it in French or German. And that is the way to see all the detail on all the pages. So here's just a quick example that uses Google Translate to, to show things like the, um, the text around the graphic that we just saw from Nicole. So if you're brand new to data share, you may not know that all of these buttons have subtopics. And again, encourage you to really explore them. This is in particular, you could see all of the indicators that are available by different location level. For example, here, you could uh, look which ones are available by zip code, for example, or census tract. There are a variety of hot topics that combine and, and curate data on these topics, youth well-being, housing, oral health, and of course COVID-19 front and center for a lot of us in, in any work that we're doing now. 
And the local progress page is where this new and exciting core results menu debuted uh, just a few days ago. So we're still finding our way around as well, but we encourage you to visit all of these. So any community resources like the Community Health Improvement Plan, the Safety Net Clinics Coalition, Cradle to Career, Thrive by Three, and the alignment information that Nicole just shared about all the different data points, these are all housed right here on this local progress page and there will no doubt be more to come. So we're just the latest addition, the core results menu. And so again, this will look familiar from what you've seen in previous core coffee chats and what Nicole just shared, but the results menu itself, as Nicole explained, lists these community level impacts or results that try and tell us how we can all contribute together in a collective impact way to these eight core conditions. Under each of the core conditions, there are buttons, clickable buttons with indicators associated with different impacts. And the impacts are trying to say, what would it look like if we had achieved equitable outcomes for each of these core conditions? So I'll go through a few examples and just let you know um, about how to navigate through some of these. But a quick reminder that no matter where you are on these pages, there, there's some unfinished business. So there's some uh, data points that are not available yet, as you see here. And these mean that they're just um, either they, they have not been added for reasons of um, maybe the data just flat out are not available yet. Maybe they don't meet some kind of minimum criteria to be added to data share because we need to make sure that there are quality data sources available at regular intervals, that sort of thing. And some of them require um, ongoing funding that's not available yet for, for both uploading and maintenance. And that's um, there are just different reasons for these gaps and the, they'll be filled over time. So just so you can be aware of that, if there's something that you're particularly interested in that's not available, um, stay tuned. If you would like to enter in the chat a, a community impact that you're particularly interested in, we'll, we'll try and weave those into our examples as we go along. So as I mentioned, lots of ways to find your way around. Right now, we don't have a, a back button to get back to the main core results menu, so you may have to just keep going up to this local progress page as I'm doing to get back there. So let me work through a couple of examples to show you some possible ways to use all this. Let's say you're interested in something like the isolation of seniors, of older adults, and something that COVID shelter-in-place requirements have possibly exacerbated. And this isn't to say that living alone as a senior is necessarily a, a threat to health and well-being. Many people choose to live that way and thrive that way, but it is associated with increased risk for limited access to support or the monitoring and responsiveness that can detect an emergency before it's flared up. So let's take a look under thriving families, this particular impact area, increased resilience among older and dependent adults, and the the button for uh, geographic isolation. So this one is showing us that there are some comparisons to other counties in the United States. We're pretty much on track with that. If you hover over these, you can get a little more detail about an actual value and what, it, what it's trying to tell you. This is a trend over time in this button or compared to other California counties and the California state value. We can also look at more data by clicking on the See More Data button. And that tells us a lot more. So it can tell us the source of the data, which in this case is the American Community Survey, the measurement period that's being covered, in this case, 2014 to 2018. And this shows that the Healthy Communities Institute, which is the, the um, firm that's maintaining all of data share, they have updated this data in March of 2020, so fairly recently. One of the advantages of data share is that instead of each of us going to the American Community Survey and finding the data that's most relevant to our particular issue or need, Healthy Communities Institute or HCI is doing that for all of these data points. So anything that you're looking at on data share, you can be confident that it is the most recent version of that data available, even if there's a time lag in the actual data. 
And these are also downloadable if you wanted to include this graph in a proposal or a, a plan. And we can look at the data in different ways, for example, by census places that shows the actual place names and a map. Again, downloadable. You might want to look at particular values here. You can look by zip code or census tract. So for any given indicator, there are many ways to slice and dice it depending on your interest and purpose. If you're a rabbit hole sort of person, as I am, you can get lost in these endless variations. There's also, if you scroll down, you can see some other options for indicators that are related to this one. So it can sort of prompt you to, to explore in a particular direction. Community resources in this case, the community assessment project or a UCSC research project are listed here. Infographics, promising practices that I'll get into in a moment. Other data resources and reports. A community health needs assessment like the seniors count needs assessment is listed here and potential funding opportunities. So these again will vary in terms of how detailed and thorough they are for each indicator. But in this case, we usually have a lot of these categories filled. So let's take a look um, at, at one of the additional indicators here. So I'm interested in people who are over the age of 65 and are living below the federal poverty level. So this lets me take a more detailed look at that. And this illustrates something that's also available for some of our indicators, but not all of them, which is to view by other subgroups. So I can look at this general uh, subcategory that has some different age markings, 65 to 74 or 75 plus. I can also look at it by gender. And I can look by race and ethnicity. So this is an important example of how we can apply the data equity lens to understanding some of the inequities and gaps that persist in our county. Again, this is not available for every single one, but where it is available, this is where you'd find it by scrolling down through these check marks here, view by subgroup. Let's do a quick tour of another example from another core condition. So in this case, I'm going to go to lifelong learning and education. And let's say that I'm interested in the educational achievement and academic skills and proficiency. So here again, we have a couple of data points highlighted. We can look at 11th grade students and their proficiency in English and language arts or math. And that's showing us a comparison to the California counties and California state values, respectively, or third grade students. But if I look at see more data, there are a lot more available. So let us know in the chat if you have a particular interest in one of these grades. And I'll just explore one. So Again, I can see the same level of detail that was shown in the previous example. And in this case, there's another wrinkle, which is that the, the uh, graph is noting that there was a change in methodology in 2016, this dotted yellow line. And it's warning us to treat that as a baseline and not make comparisons from later years to prior to that year because of the change in methodology. So again, that's something that would be tracked if it's available for each uh, each data point, and you'll see, again, the similar pieces here that we saw in the previous example. And so one more under health and wellness, just to show some of the equity data implications here. If I'm interested in insurance coverage rates, which are a precursor to access to care, but don't necessarily stand in for access to care, here we can see some differences, but already right out of the gate between access to health insurance for adults, which is in the green zone compared to California County, so that's good, and children, where we do not fare as well in comparisons. If I were to look at additional data, 
on adults with health insurance, this in general looks pretty good. It's on track with prior values compared to other California counties and the California state value. And when I look at the actual data, I see that overall 92.7 of adults, these are people between the ages of 19 and 64, so not a Medicare population, are insured, have, in, have insurance coverage. But if I look by race and ethnicity, it's a different picture. And here I see that while 92.7 is the overall figure, if you're non-white, if you're Hispanic or Latino or other, or, or multiple races, you're below 90%. So this is an example of where the data average, when it's not disaggregated, hides an inequity. And that's true for many of these indicators. So wherever it's available, we really encourage you to take a look at the race and ethnicity variable. Okay. So now you know how to find your way through the core conditions, some of the impact statements that lead to these broader community impacts and results we're seeking together. But what about strategies and program outcomes, outcomes that are closer to home at the level of your, your agency or program? If you've attended a prior core training on this, you may recognize some of this language, but I just wanna point out this button at the bottom of the core results menu strategies and program outcomes. And I'll walk through a couple of these examples as well. So on this page, we've listed out some of the ways that you might be focusing your efforts. So this is where you may be answering a question about what do I specifically want to achieve in terms of focusing my efforts on a particular group, a population of people or organizations and systems places and communities or public and political will. So I should emphasize this is really a descriptive prompt to get you to think about what you're already doing or you might do differently. It is not intended to be a thorough checklist implying that any program should do all of these things. It's really just to pinpoint what you're already doing and what you might want to consider doing differently. Under each of these menus, people, organizations and systems, places and communities, and public and political will, there are examples. So it, it prompts you with a question. So are you focusing on a particular group of people who might benefit from programs or policies? And then some strategies that might apply to that. So just to work through an example, let's say I'm particularly interested in working with women who are experiencing homelessness. And maybe I'm particularly interested now in keeping them safe during the era of COVID-19 when they may not have access to shelter, to easy ways to, um, to wash their hands or to have a, a protective equipment like masks. So I want to do a particular type of outreach, particular content to reach the women I'm working with. And so I might have some ideas in here to either tweak my current outreach and programming or to see if there are others doing similar work. If you're working with a particular population at the moment, let us know in the chat and we'd be interested in hearing about it. The next category of organizations and systems has to do with some operational sorts of things. So let's say that for, again, for this population I'm using as an example, I might be particularly interested in changing the hours of op operations for a shelter or the rules that apply to different kinds of people staying there. Um, during COVID, there might be particular policies that apply to organizations. I might have different kinds of partnerships with others to share messaging or data. So all of these would fall into this segment as well. And this is also an important place for equity uh, inquiries. So how are our hiring HR policies and practices, our procurement practices, our data and evaluation practices, either uh, helping or hindering equity initiatives. So again, if you have ideas about those, let us know in the chat. And then next we would think about, are you focusing on particular places and communities? 
So here, let's say that I, I realize there's a different need for the, the women I'm working with and I might wanna start a, a brand new shelter. So that would involve all kinds of infrastructure discussions, trying to work on neighborhood outreach, um, having some allies in this work and doing some advocacy work. And like all of these, they may overlap. So in public and political will, I might be doing things like uh, trying to help women tell their stories for an advocacy event. I might be doing other kinds of uh, gap analyses or different kinds of uh, campaigns and, and policy explorations. So these are just some ideas about what that would look like. So again, not that any of these strategies are particularly uh, better or worse than any others, but just to, to uh, expand the universe of what's being considered. And all of that leads to uh, short-term and intermediate outcomes. And those are listed here on the same section of the um, strategies and outcomes pages on the core results menu and on data share. And these are trying to answer the question of, is anyone better off through my efforts? There's a, um, a tradition in a lot of our work of just counting outputs, which, are, which can be important, how many people have been served. But this is really trying to get beyond that to think about what change is happening because of our efforts. In the short term, things that might happen immediately after a service or intervention is delivered, we might see some of these kinds of changes, changes in awareness, in knowledge, attitudes or beliefs and skills. And this is just providing some language if this is something that you're interested in incorporating or, or expanding in your current planning um, proposals, evaluations, what, what this might look like. So it might be a percentage of an increase that's detected through a survey or, or questioning or changes in skills. And at the intermediate level, we're looking at changes in behaviors that lead to changes in status. So these might be um, the outcome of the previous uh, short-term outcomes. So there might be changes in, in knowledge and skills that lead to a sustained behavior change that eventually leads to a change in status. So these are prompts for those kinds of changes. And linking those together is a, a really great feature of data share, which is the Promising Practices database. So I know we're running a little short on time, but I'm gonna do a quick tour of that just so you know where it is and how it works if you haven't discovered it already. So one of the many advantages of data share is that there are 150 different places or communities um, that are Healthy Communities Institute clients. And so this uh, Promising Practices database covers the whole country. It's not just our community. So it, it includes a variety of programs that meet some standards that HCI has set. They're very aligned with the core continuum um, that you may have seen um, in previous core trainings. And so you can search here by a keyword, a topic, and what they're calling a ranking, which we would really like to get away from. The, the continuum language is really about looking at um, different models for interventions and practices and policies and programs that have to do with how much data we already have about them. So we, we don't want to imply the judgment that ranking suggests, but really just how much do we already know or, or could learn about a particular intervention. So what they've got here are evidence-based, effective, or good idea. In the core continuum of results and evidence, we call those emerging, promising, effective, and evidence-based. And again, they're all appropriate at different points in your, in your work, but they might have different levels of evaluation and data associated with them. And, and the, the point of the continuum and of asking these questions is to just be clear about where your intervention might be um, in that continuum. So there's a local category here as well. And that has to do with, um, it, in, the, in the featured section here, in the future, we could submit Santa Cruz County programs and practices and policies to the database. 
that means that they may not have met some of these other criteria, but we find them interesting and promising here. And so they might not be shared with the whole group, but they would be um, with the 150 communities that are part of data share, but they would be available to us to look at. But meanwhile, we have this whole database to work with. So let's try just for this example, if I put in homeless as a keyword search and women, let's see what comes up. So there are a few that I can look at here and some are from the Bay Area, some are from the Midwest. There are a variety of things to look at, but let's say I was also interested in programs, policies, and laws related to this program, because I wanted to do a policy intervention. All of these have subtopics, quite a few of them. So I'm just going to try this one. And unfortunately, nothing shows up. But because I'm stubborn, I'm not going to let that go. And so I might think that my filters are too stringent, so I'm going to remove the women filter and just see what I can learn. And now I get a couple of options for things that DataShare believes fall into the, the governance, laws, policies cluster and have some potential for me to explore. And I can see here that the medical legal partnership in particular also addresses the needs of children and families. So I might start exploring how much of that is already in place in our county, are there people I can talk to? If you click on the actual example, it can lead you to a contact person and sometimes even a phone number and email, if, if that's the kind of thing you like to do to just see how it's going somewhere else. I have often found that people are very eager to talk about their programs, especially when they're successful and touted on a, on a resource like this. So again, this is just one example of ways that you can use all of these tools on data share and specifically tied through the core results menu to explore some, some ways to tweak your program, design a new program, evaluate a program, so or fund one. So this is really a one-stop shop for a lot of things together that are linked together. It's not everything. So there are going to be some gaps, but it's much more streamlined than our usual approach to trying to find things one by one. So we're really excited about it and we're excited about hearing how you use it as we go forward. And to, as Nicole said, this is an initial tour. We will be very eager to do more detailed explorations in the future and welcome your suggestions for topics that would be of particular interest to you. So I know that was a whirlwind. Um, I'm gonna turn things back over to Nicole and we'll talk a little bit more about your questions and how we can move forward together. Thanks, Nicole. That was um, that was a really good tour. And um, I am going to open it up again, see if anybody wants to ask a question. Go ahead and show your question in the chat. The only question that I saw um, asked earlier was from Dean. And it's um, so this might actually be worth showing Nicole. You might it might actually be good to um, share your screen again and, and go okay. into data share. Um, he's interested in finding the number of individuals living in the Pajaro Valley between the ages of 18 and 35. Okay. And so what Nicole is showing is that in data share, so not necessarily within the core results menu that Nicole just showed, but if you go to the data share homepage uh, and you click under the data tab, you can look for uh, summary demographics. So view data, summary demographics, that takes you to the page that Nicole is on right now. Do you want to um, talk us through, Nicole, how, you, how we might narrow that down if we're looking at particular age groups? Yeah, so let's see. Here we have some age group data. So what, what were the parameters again? Um, Pajaro Valley and 18 okay. to 35 years old. Okay, so let's see if we can get, we have some general age group data. And I'm scrolling through to see if I can get a location piece. I don't see it offhand, but I'm going to go back to. I think the you data. have to try the um, the if you remove those menus. 
Move your mouse, yeah. See where it says Santa Cruz, there's that drop down menu. Mm -hmm. So we have zip code. zip code. And I think right now, so right now the, the proxy might be searching by 95076. Yeah. It's not. Try that. It doesn't encapsulate all of Pajaro Valley. But one of the things that uh, is a possibility, hopefully in, in the near future, is that um, Healthy Communities Institute that manages this, you know, the kind of the back end of this data platform um, has said that they can create what they call these zip code roll ups, where they would basically, you know, with, with our part, our community's guidance about what zip codes are part of Pajaro Valley, they would then have a process for, <laughs> for magically combining, you know, all the data that's available by zip code so that we could like at a click of a button see data and demographics um, by zip code. Because uh, right now we can see um, demographics by, you know, age ranges in all different ways, but to be able to do that by geographic area, um, that's something that is a future data share development. And here's some other, just, I'm just scrolling through some other displays. And, and what I was starting to look for here is I know that under view data, you can look at all the indicators that are available by location level. So I just wanted to show this related to that query. So by definition, the count, they're all by county levels, but some have census place, some have zip code, and some have census tract. So you can also search for a particular indicator that you're interested in and just see at a glance whether it falls into those categories. And Nicole, maybe, um, I know we hadn't planned this, but it might actually be good to show how people, like if there are particular data points that people are interested in and they're not seeing it on data, data share, how mm -hmm. they can submit a request or mm -hmm. a, um, yeah. So as Nicole's saying, if there's something that, that you're really interested in, it's really important to your work and it's just, no matter how you look for it, you can't, whatever keywords you use, it's not showing up. You can make a formal request to DataShare Santa Cruz County to add that, that uh, indicator. So it, there's a simple form on the site and it's under the data tab and we'll ask for some contact information, but it goes through some, whoops, it's not gonna let me do that unless I fill it out. Anyway, it'll ask you some basic question about questions about the indicator, why you think it's important, if you know of an, an existing source. And so there are ways to, um, it doesn't guarantee that it'll get on there because then there's a, a, a level of um, how feasible it is and whether the data source is one that meets the, the periodicity and other standards to be on here. But at least um, you can put it on the wish list and whether it's on immediately or later, sometimes it's something that's easy for HCI to include at no cost. Sometimes there's a cost included or required. And so all of those things need to be figured out, but this is a starting point to make the request if something's missing. Are there any other questions? Um, Andrew's asking, do you provide access to any of the qualitative data or voices of the community that were used to develop any of these data points? So some of those are embedded in, I don't think there's a screen, um, unless somebody else knows of one, to find qualitative data in particular. But for example, when we showed you the, um, let's see if there's an example here, um, there might be local reports or um, particular um, survey responses, and some of these when we go into more details about a particular data point, they might show, for example, um, I'm familiar with a couple of them, that, like if there's a, a report that was done on food insecurity or an, a set of interviews about a particular topic, that might show up in a, in a, in a um, sorry, I'm not a good multitasker. <laughs> um, there might be something that shows up when, when you do the see more data and scroll down here, there might be a community resource. This one, this one doesn't have one listed, but if there were a report, it would show up 
in one of these places here on this lower segment. And Healthy Communities oh, Institute is also uh, working on a, what I think they call it like a storytelling tool that will be embedded in the data share platform, which uh, will be more of an opportunity to combine both the quantitative data, like what we've been showing you, and then uh, some of that qualitative data where communities could use you know, narratives or videos or links to other um, types of you know, quotes or stories that just enriches the quantitative data that's in data share. So that feature, um, HCI is working on it. It's more of like a you know, website development um, aspect of the work. And so when that becomes available, it'll be available to all the communities that use um, the HCI platform. And so including us in Santa Cruz County, um, we don't know yet when that will become available, um, but that will definitely be an important part of complementing the data that's on data share. So I'm scrolling through the Cradle to Career um, page under the, some of the local um, options here. And so this is just describing some of the advocacy work and parent leadership. So it's not a pure data piece in terms of charts. It's got photos and other examples. So, so you might have to look around a little uh, do a different kind of search than for just a, an indicator or a key term, but some of the particular pages and, and topics have these things embedded and there's opportunities to do lots more, as Nicole said. So Nancy is commenting that this is tremendous. <laughs> we agree. Uh, we agree. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody that's ever tried to hunt down data for a grant or a report or even just like a newsletter or something and, and has had to, you know, search in multiple places and then try to figure out what the data <laughs> actually says. Uh, we'll probably appreciate data share itself and then hopefully the, <clears throat> the way it's organized in the core results menu again will be a helpful tool for both connecting the work you do at a program level or policy advocacy level to uh, community impacts. And again, this is truly the tip of the iceberg. You can see there's just so much here. Um. So maybe we should uh, move on and, and talk about what we see as our next steps, Nicole. Yeah, let's do that. And I'll share. So because this core results menu is brand new, you know, we had a lot, we got a lot of input and feedback as we were developing the concept of it, figuring out, you know, creating and, and matching impact statements and indicators to the core results. We had a lot of input and feedback as we were doing that. Uh, several people weighing in and helping us think through how it should look and how it should function on data share. Um, but we realized that now that it is live, we'd love to have a small co cohort of people working with us over the next four to five months that can actually be our test users. That um, basically we're looking for five to six people that represent different types of groups and organizations, big and small, nonprofits, public agencies, grassroots, you know, community leaders, anybody that, you know, thinks that they might, you know, use the core results menu for, for some type of purpose. Variety of roles, um, whether you are, a, you know, someone that writes grants and reports and uses data all the time or someone who, you know, doesn't really love data, but thinks, well, maybe this could be <laughs> a little bit better than having to do, you know, my own research. Variety of experience and uh, familiarity with, with data. We'd love to have, you know, different people also that speak English and or Spanish. So we can also get some feedback about the Spanish version of the menu. Um, so then, you know, what we would ask is for you to, if you, if we uh, select you to work with us, you know, explore the core results menu on your own. We'll probably give some guided, you know, like homework or, or assignments just so that we can really thoroughly be testing different aspects of the results menu and different uses of the results menu. Um, so test it out on your own uh, and then meet with us two to three times over the next um, several months either individually with us or in that small cohort so that you can share your feedback with us about your experience using it. You can ask us questions, 
You can provide suggestions for future improvements to the core results menu because this will be an ongoing process. And we'd also like to ask those test users, once you've had enough kind of time and experience uh, playing around with the core results menu, to then show two to three other people, either in your group or your organization, how to use the core results menu, because that's how we'll start to you know, spread the knowledge and, spread and increase the use of it. And so because we're asking, so we, let me just say, we would welcome any and all feedback, even if you're not one of our test users, you know, our designated test users, uh, because that's how we'll learn, you know, what will make it more useful or what features are, are particularly useful. But for those of those of you or those people that are that become part of our test user cohort, because we'd be asking you to really dig deep and, and meet with us um, and provide you know some detailed feedback that will be usable and useful to us, that we'd like to offer a stipend for that. And so the stipend will be anywhere from three hundred to four hundred fifty dollars, depending on how many of those meetings um, or peer trainings that you do or or attend. Um, and then the higher rate is also reflects a bilingual differential because we um, value that experience and, and skill. And so we have an, an interest form. It's a Google form that if, you, if this sounds uh, interesting to you, you'd like to be considered for it, then please go ahead and fill out that, that form. I'm gonna put it in the chat. And we'll uh, take a look at those. We're, we'll collect all the interest forms until October 30th, and then we'll go through them and, and see if we uh, have our five or six people or if we need to do some more recruitment or trim the list a little bit. And so uh, we would love to have some of you be part of that test user group. Or if you have a coworker who's not on the call today who you think might be a good candidate for that, let us know that as well or share with them. Okay. And then I think as we kind of move into our home stretch here, we want to share some of the upcoming coffee chats and events, core events. So next Tuesday, during our regular 10 to 11 o'clock time slot, uh, we'll have Kaylin uh, Foster Render from Monarch Services talking with us about addressing family violence while sheltering in place and how Monarch Services in particular has adapted um, given these times we're in. We're taking Tuesday, November 3rd off because we want to encourage everybody to vote or, <laughs> uh, or we just realize everyone might be distracted because of the big election day. And then the week, uh, the following week, instead of doing our usual Tuesday morning coffee chat, uh, CORE is actually co-hosting another large convening again, this time with the Santa Cruz County ACEs Network of Care. The topic is the pair of ACEs in practice. The pair of ACEs being adverse childhood experiences in the context of adverse community environments and how important it is to be addressing both in order to build resilient communities. And so our featured speakers are from the Center for Community Resilience that really are the ones that developed that pair of ACEs framework. Um, this is all happening as part of the ACEs Aware initiative that's being led at the state, but we have local partners that have been funded to um, do some you know, learning sessions and peer-to-peer uh, -peer, uh, support sessions to, um, to support the statewide initiative. And so it's all an attempt to increase awareness about adverse childhood experiences in general, the importance of screening, and then how we as a community or a network of care can be ready to respond uh, and prevent ACEs from occurring in the first place. So registration is open for that convening now. I've just posted the link to the, to the registration in the chat box. It's open to anyone, even if you're not involved or directly involved or a healthcare provider. Um, we, you know, when we talk about a network of care, we really do mean all of us, like everybody, all the types of organizations that typically participate in these coffee chats. So we would love to have a, a broad variety of people participating in that session. And then as usual, we would love to get your feedback about today's coffee chat in the survey, our online survey that we have, and I'm posting the links here in the chat. So we have one feedback survey uh, in English and the other in Spanish. Well, I think that is all we have for today. We are again so uh, pleased that all of you joined us for this kind of inaugural tour of the results menu and 
uh, we hope that you try it out and, and send us your feedback, whether you're part of the, the test user group or not. And stay tuned for future coffee chats on this topic. Thanks, everyone. And we'll stay on for a few more minutes in case anybody has any questions. So I didn't have to talk so fast, huh? <laughs> Nice to have a few extra minutes. Hi, Nicole. It's Andrea. What time Hi. commitment do you think it would be to be part of the small user groups? Um, how often do you think you'll meet over the three months and for what length of time? It'll, um, we're anticipating just two to three asking for two to three meetings. And each one probably like an hour, hour and a half, depending on whether we do you know, all five or six people together and or try to break it up into smaller. And, and would it be an opportunity to not just learn the navigation of the system, but to ask other questions like, um, do you foresee development of an equity lens, um, maybe a series of questions for users? Um, yep to start practicing that skill so exactly. that so, they do not, so they learn how to interpret and use the tool in a way that actually addresses systemic racism or I love Dean's question, you know, Pajaro Valley for us as a district, we are so unique because we include zip codes across the county line. And so those children and families are actually part of the Santa Cruz County educational ecosystem. They're under the purview of our county. And yet people forget about that. So when we talk about Pajaro Valley, it includes that bubble of Monterey County. And to really be authentic and true in what we do, we always have to look at those zip codes as well. And I don't know that people actually know that. So if there's a way in a portal like this to let users know, don't forget, you know, this, or um, did you know zip code is one of the biggest indicators of health outcomes, right? Things like that. So anyway, so that would be my interest in joining is I really enjoy asking questions and thinking about things in this moment. And, um, and I'll, I'll look and see if I have time. Um, the next few months are a little busy, but um, I think this is an important priority. And thank you so much for your work here. And I was thrilled to see CAP as a foundation of the data set. You're welcome. And we, we also are, appreciate your interest. And um, yes, that, that's exactly the kind of thing we're thinking about is really applying this, uh, figuring out some use scenarios that are not just to the individual benefits of the people participating in this little cohort, but could be shared with others more widely um, and raise up some issues about how to use the, the tool or tools. So, um, so it sounds like that would be exactly how we're envisioning it. Well, thank you. That's what I wanted to check to make sure how I would you know, want to share my thoughts and, and wisdom um, would align with where you're going because um, the time is now. If we yeah. do not start to teach people how to do this properly, we will never um, accomplish. And I'm really interested in, in the voices of the community. You know, I think besides user groups, I think it'd be wise to be able to validate, you know, that all of these... Um, data points or even like your the data points in the education domain you know we've expanded what we think of as success for our students you know we have how many bilingual students in our part of the county that is such an enormous skill um, and strength that they have and there's no data point to capture that you know right. there's no <laughs> and that that's just that hurts that fundamental equity lens when we don't value their inherent strengths and capabilities. So I would also be looking to help vision that um, for you guys. Thank you. That would be incredible. Cause I think that's, um, you know, I think we wanna view the core results menu as a living tool that hopefully will, you know, continue to adapt and improve as, as 
more people use it and as we get those kinds of questions and that kind of feedback and so being able to have that kind of ongoing you know communication with you Andrea you know especially as a you know staff member of the of the largest school district in our county I think would yep. be fantastic yeah yeah just so that people know what we're doing it's mm -hmm. um we're trying to drive change and mm -hmm. um and we're excited I hope you guys have received the invitation to the state of the district Mm -hmm. um, that's happening tomorrow morning. So you can see we'll have a few more beautiful data points um, and the framing of whole child um, supports and student success under a new definition that really um, that really lifts us all up. So anyway, okay. I know everybody has to go. Thank you. Thanks, yeah, Andrea. Yeah, so glad, so glad and thankful for um, all your work on this. Appreciate Good it. to see you. Thank you, Maricela. Maricela, right, so I'm going to turn the interpretation off. And stop.